My name is Jim Craven. My Blackfoot name is Mahko Kiyakpui. I'm a former professor of economics and geography, and I'm one of the designated spokespersons for STTPML. What we're trying to do is to explain some of the real history of our, of our country. We're trying to explain how the past lives in the present. And, how, and when the past lives in the present and it's not recognized, it's not exposed, it's not addressed, then that also bears on what kind of future we have ahead of us. Example, we're going to be starting our first series, we're going to be talking about treaties. Now why would we be talking about treaties? Well, and what relevance does that have for non-Indian people? Well, the relevance is that treaties are basically about war and peace. They're about commercial and other kinds of relations between nation states. They're sometimes about human rights. But most often, treaties are about what? They're about property rights. They're about who owns the property in law. Because you see, here's the problem. If I steal from you, okay, I steal a sandwich or whatever from you, well, unless somebody catches me, unless somebody fills me, unless you file a complaint, I'm going to get away with it. And nobody's going to steal it from me as I stole it from you. But as soon as we start getting into land, as soon as we start getting into property of other forms, then the fundamental question is, how was that property why? Because I can, under the law, we're talking about capitalist law, under the law, I can what? I can, I can gift property, I can sell, or I can bequeath, as in a will. But in all of those three cases, I cannot sell, or buy, or bequeath, and keep, or gift stolen property. Property for which I do not have property rights and title. Why? Because if there weren't a system of property rights and title, then as I acquired that land from you, you could also equally acquire it back from me using the same methods I used to steal it from you. Or you could sell it to another person, but again, you don't get to what? You don't get to keep stolen property, um, even if you didn't know it was stolen. That's the way the law works. Okay? There's two other ways you can acquire property. One is through just war. But it has to be a just war. It means that you were on the defense, not the offense. It means you were a victim of aggression, not the cause of it. And the fifth way is through discovery. Okay? Discovering property or land that no one else has, has been there and they title to or, or, um, or used and claimed. But you can't discover land or property with people already there unless what? Unless they're not people unless somehow you could convince people that the original discoverers, the original inhabitants of a given area of land weren't really people or qualified to be seen as people in terms of their own property rights and protecting them. That's what it means. Okay. So we're going to be talking about property rights and treaties, but not just to go back in the past and talk about old issues, but what are the, what are the relevance, what is the relevance to today to you not only for indigenous people who may be watching this series, but also for all of you who are non-indigenous people. We're the canary in the mind, okay? Today it's us, tomorrow it's the rest. It's in your interest, it's in our interest, it's in everyone's interest that we unite, that we put down the stereotypes, we put down the caricatures, we put down the jokes on all sides, and we start talking together about issues that we have in common. This series is not meant to really offend you. It's not, it's not, we're not trying to guilt trip people. We're trying to tell the truth. We're trying to tell how the past is not the past. But the past is directly, intimately, in our face and in your face, embodied in the present. And until we deal with it, then you know what's going to happen. All we're going to do is compound the lies, compound the contradictions, compound the issues, and what that means is at some point we're going to have to deal with them. Usually at the time we're least least able to deal with them. Perfect example is all over the United States. Why are, there, why are there, for example, uncontrolled fires all over this country right now? Because why? Because signs were there long ago. The imperative to build up fire protection and whatever was there long ago. And what happened was denial after denial after denial after denial. Until what happened was these fires all of a sudden erupted everywhere and exposed what? 
that the issues why these fires are taking place all over the place have been there a long time. They weren't addressed, they were, they were denied, they were covered up. The, the, the resources weren't built up to develop the, you know, the capabilities to deal with the situation. And now we have what? We have another situation that we're, we're possibly passing the tipping point. The same thing in the Middle East. Serial neglect, serial denial of realities that, that we helped to engineer that were predicted long ago to come back in our faces and that have come back in our faces. And again, over and over again, we get the same story. Where did this all come from? Why is this all happening now? And so what we're trying to provide in this series here, 15 minute modules, is, is not only to bring the in, in American Indian world to you, the outsiders, and even also to other indigenous people, by the way, because there are many indigenous people who haven't lived on the res, don't know what res life is like. like. They've been in urban Indians most of their, or all their lives. But they're still Indians. They're still regarded and treated as Indians, no matter where they come from. We want to bring their voices. We want to bring hard evidence to you. We want to bring documents to you. We want to bring the exact treaties that were signed in your name as American people, binding you, the American people, to the terms of these treaties in the same way that we indigenous people are also bound by the terms of those same treaties. And only nations make treaties. People can't make treaties. People make contracts. And, and, and treaties are a form of contract, although much more than that. But people can make, can make contracts amongst each other. But people cannot make treaties. Only sovereign governments can make treaties. And furthermore, when sovereign governments make treaties, each is recognizing the other as not only a sovereign government, but a legal government that has the authority and standing to sign that treaty and to bind their populations to the terms of that treaty for as long as the treaty is in effect. And that means you're also recognizing what? The system of government that produced the leadership that had the standing, that had the recognized authority to sign the treaty in the first place. You can't have a treaty between two nations, the terms of which is to abolish one of the nations as a nation. It's an inherent contradiction. Because only knowing only nations can sign treaties and make treaties and ratify treaties. But only nations can keep them. And only nations can mobilize their forces or restrain their populations in such ways as to keep the terms of the treaty. Because in a treaty, like any contract, each party receives what's called consideration. That means something for something, okay? And, and that means that whenever somebody has received something for something, and they've had to change their life ways, and change their life in return for, you know, for certain benefits, and they give up certain other benefits to do so, then those treaties have to be kept. Otherwise, you have one side sitting there paying, giving up, keeping the terms of the treaty, while the other side is what? Systematically violating the terms of the treaty when they choose or when they claim it in conflicts with their sovereignty. By the way, and we're going to be exploring this in more detail, Article 6, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, treaties shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges of each state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution of the laws of any state notwithstanding. What that means is simply this. Once you sign a treaty, you cannot then say, but if there's parts of this treaty that we find objectionable or conflicting with our own Constitution or our own laws, as only interpreted by us, we will consider those portions of the treaty null and void. No, it doesn't work that way. It's like your landlord, okay, signing a lease agreement with you, but saying you've got to obey all the rules of this lease agreement, but I may drop it, I may change the terms if they're inconvenient for me, or if, if certain circumstances change. That's what a promise means. A promise means what? A commitment no matter what that you, that you keep. If you can't make a promise you keep, you don't make the promise. If you don't like the terms of the treaty for some reason, then you don't sign the treaty. But once you sign the treaty, you are bound by law to the terms of it. 
and you cannot say, but this term or this term or this term is exempt. I don't recognize this term in the treaty. You've signed the treaty. Once you've signed the treaty, you've signed to all the requirements on your side. The other side has signed on to the requirements on their side so that there is a meeting of minds. Because in any valid treaty, like in any valid contract, there has to be a meeting of minds. There has to be mutual informed consent. Okay? There has to be consideration. This for that. Both sides have to receive something for what they gave up. Okay? It has to be in legal form. It cannot violate any statutes or existing laws. Or if it does, guess what? The terms of the treaty become part of the supreme law of the land. They become part of the Constitution itself. Which means they trump anything else that may conflict at a lower level, at a state level or local level, or municipal level, you see? And so, we're going to explore these issues along with other issues that bear directly on the issues of our times. Not only for indigenous people, but also issues for non-indigenous people. Not only issues from 150 years ago, but how 150 years ago, up to today, what we see of that portion of American history is still alive and well in the present. And it's still haunting us in the present, and it won't go away. Just imagine, for example, in, 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 you, you will hear from us, um, sometimes we get a little bit raw, I hope you can handle it, we don't mean to curse and, and be profane, we try not to, but we're going to be getting very real in this, in this series, very real. So once in a while, when you get real, your language gets very real too. Because one of the things we also want to do for you is for you, those of you who have never been in, 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 in our, our world, we want to take you there into our world to a certain extent to which we can. And not just with videos or whatever, but with images and with memes and with humor to give you an idea of what it's like inside the Indian world that nobody talks about. I mean, even the Democrats don't want us. The Democrats will take anybody. They'll use anybody. You go to a democratic convention, there's no mention of, of Indians, American Indians there. None. And Republicans, well, you could just forget that one completely. So we're the lost people. We're, 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 the, we're the reminder to America that your image of America, the beautiful, whatever, and that there's many beautiful things about this country, many beautiful things that, that this country has done. But there's another side. And if you want to tell the real story and you want to learn the real lessons of history, then you have to tell all of it. You can't tell just the parts of history that are convenient to your present images and your present illusions and your present property rights to retain them. All over America, places like Ferguson, Missouri, are under siege. And they're under siege because of their own contradictions, because of their own arrogance, because of their own refusal to change and trying to hang on to a world and a world lifestyle that's simply not tenable anymore. These small little towns like the one I live in, Van Vancouver, Washington, which is known as Ventucky, Washington. And in that, that references to parts of Kentucky where allegedly family trees don't branch and where um, people go to family reunions looking for dates and mates. It's a metaphor for inbreeding, which is unfair to the people in Kentucky, but it's a common metaphor that's used here. This refers to inbreeding. And all over this country, we have these small little towns with their little city councils, all white, with their, with their police forces, all white. And I, I don't mean white is bad. There's nothing bad about being white. No one chooses their, their birth or their, their blood or whatever. It's only a problem when you're smugly white and openly proudly white. And when you think that being white is some kind of credential or some kind of badge of worth, being in God's grace, or having providence on your side, now that's a problem. Now we've got, now you're in someone else's face with what's going on in your head. And so all over America, there are these little towns built on theft, built on entrenched little power structures that are hidden, non-transparent, non-accountable. County sheriffs, superior court judges, local businesses, local newspapers, local TV and radio stations, okay? key politicians, 
they're all involved in these little towns and they're, and they're terrified of accountability, of transparency, and about their own entrenched power structures through which they've been able to rule, now being dragged out into the open and made accountable and transparent. That's part of what we're going to be doing here too, because as we discuss, for example, treaty rights, and as we discuss how those treaty rights from, from 150 years ago directly impact your living situation and quality of life today, I promise you that we will be showing some things that will be very disturbing and they are particularly disturbing to these people in power right now. Because if you look in history, the Indian boarding schools and residential schools, the forced conversions, the missionaries, the drugs, all the rest of it were instruments of, of breaking the link between indigenous people and their land. Why? Because what defines a nation is a matter of facts on the ground and law, not a matter of whether someone recognizes a group of people as a nation or not. Otherwise, one nation could do what? They can exterminate another by simply what? Not recognizing them as a nation. Does this sound familiar? You see? Imagine we had a Bureau of Caucasian Affairs, a Bureau of African American Affairs, a Bureau of Af American Asian, Asian American Affairs, we don't. Imagine if, if African-American people had to prove how much African-American they were to be registered. Or Caucasian people had to prove that they were at least 25% Caucasian to be registered by the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs. Which means, by the way, that you live on a Caucasian reserve. Now you can't even sell a rock. You can't even pick up a rock that looks nice and sell it without a BIA, BIA certificate. Or in Canada, a DIA certificate. So Indians cannot even on their own land sell anything without a BIA or DIA certificate. Not even a rock of land, not even a rock from the land. What's that about, you see? And how can you be called a nation, but then turn around and call it a dependent captive nation? There's no such thing in law. Under law, once someone is covered under law, the standard of equal protection and equal treatment means what? There are no special exemptions under the same body of law. Imagine, for example, we go to court and, some, and the lawyer says, Your Honor, my client can't be charged with this crime because his net worth is over $5 million. And only people with a certain net worth can be charged with a crime. If you're above that net worth, you're exempt from, from, from the law. And imagine it said that in the law that if you were, had a certain amount of wealth, the terms of that law didn't apply to you. How long would that law last? You see? So in order to maintain the illusion of peace and freedom, and equal exchange, and fair bargains, nobody makes a deal unless it's what? In their interest, therefore what? Any deal that's made must have been what? In the mutual interest of both parties. Is that true? Have you ever heard of people being forced to sign contracts because the alternative was death? How about if you, how about if your landlord, for example, had you sign a lease agreement with a gun to your head? Or how about if your landlord forced you to sign a lease agreement? Let's say you're a single mother with three kids and very few skills. And your landlord says, I'll give you this, this cut deal and in return for sexual favors and in return for you not reporting me or exercising the terms of this lease. How would that fly? Would, would you have a valid contract then? Would you have a valid treaty if this were done between two nations? No, not even under the canons of, 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 of treaty law and, and treaty construction or constitutional law and constitutional construction. Would you have either a valid constitution or a valid treaty? So these are facts. And these are facts that we could bring to you through hard documents, through hard research, through, through, through things that we had no hand in originally. And we ask you to find out who we are and what we're about and where we're going with this, then please go to http colon sttpml.org so that the people's name live. That is the first mandate for all indigenous societies. It's why we do what we do, everything we do. When, when indigenous people, for example, plan a winter count, 
They're not counting animals to see how many they can kill. They're counting animals to see how many will live. In other words, they're counting animals, for example, to see what is the basic requirement to get through the winter, to survive, and so what? Not only to survive, but to, to reproduce sustainability, to be sustainable, and to have a viable society that builds for the seventh generation, that looks that far down the road, okay, to the seventh generation. In this culture here, what, what, how far down the road do we look in this culture? Quarterly bottom line, perhaps? The next day? The next week? Indigenous societies always were looking down the road, far down the road. Imagine, for example, the Mayan calendar, invented in 3750 BCE, three wheels. It has an error rate of two hours every 500 years in terms of predicting the movements and relative positions of astronomical bodies, and as well as eclipses and other things. Imagine that, 5,000 years old. The only way that could have been done is with knowledge of advanced calculus. The Bayan, for example, had the concept of zero 800 years before Europe. Without the concept of zero, Advanced mathematics is impossible. You see the point? We want to break down some stereotypes here. We want to bring to you what indigenous people have always had to offer. But at most of the time it was refused, if not exterminated, along with the people who carried the knowledge, and who carried the traditions. We have something to offer. We also live here. Okay? One of the things we also want to get into, when we get into the issue of trees, for example, Okay, we're going to get into the issue of trees. This is going to be our starting point. We're going to discuss two different treaties. The Fort Laramie Treaty for the Lakota people, 1868, and the Fort Benton or Laramie Treaty of the Blackfoot, 1855. And the reason why we're going to discuss that is because this particular subject here has direct relevance for all of you in terms of your present situation. Not only in terms of status of indigenous people, but your own property rights. Your own property rights. Because what, what we're going to talk about here is what real property rights do any of us really have? If you think about it. Example, if I pay off the mortgage on my house, is the house mine? Not really, because I can pay property taxes. If I don't pay my property taxes, what do they do? They grab my whole house, even though it's paid for. You see? So we're going to talk about treaties. And we're going to talk about treaties as what? As covenants, contracts, if you will, between what? Between nation, states because it takes some form of government to make a treaty. When we, when the United States of America, for example, signed the treaties, the Fort Laramie Treaty and the, uh, the Fort Benton or, or uh, Lame Bull Treaty, or the Black Bull, they didn't pass it around to all Americans to sign whether they agreed with it or not. Representatives of Americans in the American government signed for all Americans and bound all Americans to be what? To the terms of that treaty, okay? The same thing among the indigenous nations. They were nation states, which means what? They had to be what? They had to be sovereign governments. and recognized as such by each. Otherwise, who's signing for all Blackfoot people or all Lakota people? Who's signing for all Americans and all American people and binding them to the terms of the agreement unless what? Unless they are not only sovereign, but recognized as the what? As the legitimate government having the authority and standing to sign the treaty and to bind the what? P 
peoples of these nation states because it's really not a covenant between the nation states, it's between the peoples of different nation states. As signed by what? As signed by their authorized representatives and as ratified according to their own systems of law. So what happens is also, because treaties are covenants, agreements between nation states, and only nation states can make them, then those nation states have to be what? They have to be seen and recognized as sovereign, as governments, as legitimates, and also the system of government system of government is accepted by the other party. What does that mean? It means that I may not be, in, if, I'm, if I'm, for example, Lakota, Lakota, and I'm signing for Lakota people, I may not be happy at all about the system of government of the United States, which is basically for sale. Basically, a bunch of people stand up and run themselves for office, and they ask for votes for people they don't know, people they would never talk and talk and talk and, and stop and talk to on the street if they saw them. And they sell themselves like cornflakes, basically, and they take money to get in power and to do favors for those who got them in power with their money. That's the American system of government in a, in a nutshell. Does that mean we're very happy about that system of government? No. No, we're not. No, we're not. And most Americans apparently are not happy with that kind of system of government either, of office for sale. But for purposes of the treaty, we accept, we accept the, that the system of the United of the government of the United States is de facto the legitimate ruling system of the United States. And we accept its legitimacy. We recognize its legitimacy. We don't quarrel with its legitimacy. Even if, as Americans, for example, if, if we, for those who are dual nationals or whatever, we're going to talk about that, by the way, too, in, in real detail. What does it mean to be an Indian and are you an American and so on? We're going to talk about that, too. But what it means is, for purpose of the treaty, we accept the system of the United States government as a de facto, legitimate, governing, recognized system for producing the what? For producing the leadership, the legitimate leadership of the nation state that has the agreement, that has the authority and standing to what? To sign the treaty. Because when you make a treaty, for example, in American law, who makes treaties? Does the president make treaties in American law? No. There's only one body that can make and ratify treaties, and that is the what? The upper house of the Congress. That's the only body on the U.S. Constitution that makes and ratifies treaties. Why? Because treaties have implications not only for the present, but they have implications for the future. That's what I meant when I said the past, the present, the future are in many ways delusion. Because once we sign a treaty, we undertake not only restrictions on our sovereignty, Article 6, Section 2, we lose some of our sovereignty with respect to what? With respect to any terms of the treaty that we think may conflict with what? With our own laws or our own constitution. Then you don't sign a treaty, period. Or what you do is you clean up the treaty so there aren't such contradictions. But once you sign the treaty, you don't get to say, but it is a promise. Because each party is restructuring part of its life. You understand? Just the same way that when you, when you, when you get a lease on, on, on an apartment, and the terms say you can't have pets, smoking, and whatever, you're doing what? You're restructuring your life, part of your life, in return for what? In return for an, an agreement that, that brought you some benefits. It brought benefits to the person, the other person with whom you signed the agreement. And thus, you what? No benefits without what? Without costs. And no costs without benefits. You see the point? So, 
on our next module, we're going to get, we're going to start here with treaties. And we're going to start with not only the past, not, again, we're not a bunch of whining Indians, but we are people who've done some, some research on this area and who've lived it. All of us in the STP, STTPML collective are res based in the sense that we've either lived on the res or we have close relations on the res right now. That means we're in daily or direct contact with the reses. And so we're going to be bringing you voices from Indian country that you will never, ever hear on the mainstream media. I promise you that. You won't be seeing us on Charlie Rose. Okay? But you'll be seeing us answering some of the things on Charlie Rose. You won't see us on CBS News in the morning. Okay? We, we won't be showing up there. But we, what we hope is that you'll keep an eye out for us. We'll be launching initially on, on YouTube. We also, by the way, we are a collective. What that means is every single, we have no leadership. Okay, there's nobody in our collective who's a leader, superstar, whatever. I'm a spokesperson because of my skill set and because I'm a former teacher. And, and the people in the collective believe that I might be able to, 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 to be a, a good person to present our case because I'm used to, to teaching and so on. But every person in our collective has one vote. They are all equal. There are no superstars. Our decisions are made purely on the basis of reason, law, evidence, Okay, not William, but what, what, what our mission is. And our mission, our mission is simply to, to, to build bridges between the indigenous and non-indigenous world, to fight for our rights and to tell, to serve notice that we do not petition for our rights. We're going to take them. And we're going to take them with, with some of the same law that, were, that was used to take us, take the properties and our lives from us. We're not promoting violence. We're not promoting anything. What we are promoting is truth. We're promoting no more historical revisionism. It's actually translated, if the word exists, when it's, it is translated to defenders. And there's a very big difference because the only time we ever had to go to war was in defense. We do not believe in unilateral, preemptive, aggressive wars. We believe that having to go to war is a failure, not a success. It is not something to be celebrated. And the act of war is not to be celebrated. Even what it does to the enemy, it is not to be celebrated. Because the reality is that we know this from our own life experiences. That it's not the majority of people who start wars. It's a few in their name. It's not the majority of people who profit from wars. It's a few in their name. It's not a majority who go to war. It's a few in their name. Less than 1% of the American public have ever even seen military service. So we, we remember a time vividly, vividly. Imagine, we, we weren't even American citizens until 1924, and that was against our will. Nobody ever consulted us. You see? Okay, we're going to take a break now. So, again, this first module, folks, is to introduce you to us, STTPML, so that the peoples may live, and to give you an idea of what we're about, what our backgrounds are, and to show you where we're going, what kind of information, how this is useful for non-Indigenous people as well as Indigenous people. But we have to tell you, this is straight up, what we're about is this. Not making war, but we are defenders. And we are defenders of these, con of these treaties. We're defenders of the U.S. Constitution. We're defenders even of those non-Indians who forced those treaties and with whom we signed the treaties. We're even defenders of that. And what we're also urging is we have American Indians right now in both the U.S. and Canada who are being arrested wholesale, who have no idea what their rights are, either under American law or under treaty law, because these treaties set up a system of governance and in terms of meeting the terms of the treaty. In other words, when two parties sign a treaty, 
you can't leave it simply up to one side to interpret what the treaty means, which parts of the treaty are operable, which parts they want to keep or not. There has to be some kind of independent adjudication, right? Because two parties have, may have two different views on what the language of the treaty says and, and thus what their responsibilities are. So we are advocates of knowing indigenous people know your treaties. Not only know your treaties, but keep those copies of those treaties with you at all times. For example, this is the Blackfoot Treaty from Fort Benton, also known as the Lame Bull Treaty, 1855. This recognizes a Blackfoot nation on both sides of the Canadian and U.S. border, before there was a Canadian and U.S. border, I might add. And so we are also advocates of know your treaty and know your treaty rights. And also we are advocates of know your constitution and what the, what the role of treaties in international law are in terms of our own sovereign government and our own sovereign constitution. And we are advocating, frankly speaking, that when American Indians are picked up by the police or if they're in a court situation, and if they're asked, are you an American citizen? You answer that question with, I am Lakota, I am Blackfoot, I am Northern Cheyenne, I am Bonka. Whatever your nation is, that's your answer. And then you stand on your treaties that your nation has made with the U.S. government. And you stand on those treaty rights. In other words, we're going to talk about what do you do when you're confronted with law enforcement or the judicial system. And they are trying to get you to answer questions like, are you an American citizen, that are intended to entrap you into a situation, legal situation, from which it's hard to extricate yourself. And so what we're going to also do, and this, by the way, applies to non-indigenous people, what will your rights are when you're stopped? Are we preaching against the police? No. Are we saying all cops are bad? No. But we, we do know our reality. You see? The town I live in right here is a microcosm. It's almost an exam example of Ferguson, Missouri. It is a place, and there are places like it all over America, run by these people who fancy themselves as settlers and having set their stock in genes. And they occupy, under, underground, the commanding heights of the different communities in which they, they live. They control the school boards, the major churches, the local media. They've infiltrated the, 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 the they got teachers in the school system, the police, the local sheriff, the local city police, even the local FBI's are usually staffed by their, 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 their most backward elements. They put stuck them in the, in the small towns as a sort of punishment. Or grooming. The very young ones also get, get put in the small towns for grooming. And guess where else they get put? They get put on Indian reservations. Because all Indian reservations, by the way, have a resident FBI agent on board under federal authority. So what we're, we have concrete experience with this. Because you see, the world is changing colors of the human family are changing into new proportions. And these subterranean power groups in places like where I live and other places like Ferguson, Missouri, these people see their lives, they think, slipping away. They think they see their, their entrenched white privilege and white power. And by the way, we're not rapping. Most of us are mixed race. I'm mixed race. A lot of us. We're not anti-white. We're not bashing whites. We'd be bashing our own parents. This is not about that. This is not about Indians whining. This is not about bashing whites. This is not about hatred. This is not about payback. This is not about Lone Ranger and Tano. This is not about any of that. This is about the system and the, system and the trees and the system of property rights and other rights under which you all live as well as we live. And what we're saying is, let's sit down together, indigenous and non-indigenous people, and let's walk through this. Let's unpack this piece by piece by piece. Let's unpack it.
and let's see who wins and who loses. Let's see whether you've been told the real story of American history or not that can stand up. You see? Do you want your own children? You're raising your children to live in a, in a world that's unlike the world you lived in, right? There wasn't nearly the diversity in the, in the world I lived in, I was raised in, as now, okay? You didn't see any white women in power in my day. You didn't see any Indians in power in my day. The thought of an even half African American president was unthinkable in my day. And so the world is changing and some people are scared that their traditional powers, their traditional entrenched privilege, that they, their, their genes, their skin color that they're so proud of that they had nothing to do with. No one chooses their skin color or their parents. It's not something that's a credential, something you brag about. It's just a fact. Now what you do with that fact is something different. If you think your white skin is a sign of having been ordained by God to be one of those in grace and having providence, you've got a problem. Because now you're speaking for God, you see. And your own good book says you're not supposed to do that. No mortal is supposed to speak from the mind of God. Your own good book says that. So what we're going to do is we're going to, it's going to get raw. It's going to get very raw in some ways. We mean no offense. Okay? You know the old country western song? If you don't want the answer, don't ask the question. So if you come to visit us at STP, STTPML and you watch our 15 minute modules that we're going to be setting up for you, they will be 15 minutes of intense stuff. Okay? And that's why we're keeping them to 15 minutes. If we made them longer, then it gets really, probably you're probably bored with me even right now. But this, remember folks, this is an introduction. This is who we are. This is where we're going. Uh, some of us, our credentials will be presented um, uh, with, the, with the video, so you see who we are, what our backgrounds are, okay? Whether we have any kind of training and experience to speak on some of these issues. But I promise you, we're not just a bunch of whining, ranting Indians. We have something to say. I think it's in your interest. Whether you're an indigenous person or not, I think it's in your interest to see this. And we want also all indigenous people to understand very clearly what are your rights as an indigenous person? What do you do when you're confronted by the power of the state and it's an unfair confrontation? Or even if it's fair, what do you do to protect your rights? And that's what we're urging. We're urging all indigenous people to find out about their treaties, to read their treaties very carefully. 